want to say I do give honor to our bishop in, in his absence and how much I appreciate him and, of course, the ministry team to my left and my right and all of our wonderful leaders in the church. And I thank God for my wonderful wife. I'll compliment my boys since they're not in the room. Appreciate them as well. And um, just it's just so good to have. What a blessing it is to have to have a great family. And um, so my wife and I are going to be celebrating 23 years of, of marriage next month, which is it's hard to believe. But when you get married in fifth grade, then that's just what happens. <laughs> and so I'll never stop telling that joke as long as you all keep laughing at it. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, anyway, we're going we're gonna to get into the Word of God tonight. And I'm going to teach here for the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, something that's been in, been in my spirit. Um, Bishop reached out to me the other day and let me know, asked if I had something, and I, I did. It's something that's kind of been, been gnawing at me a little bit, and uh, um, I'm going to do my best to, to share with you some things that the Lord has talked to me about. And if I seem a little tired, it's only because about five and a half hours ago, I was, I was on the northwest side of Chicago in a meeting and left about a quarter to two, and I had to ask you know, the Lord to give me the foot of Brother NASCAR that Prophet Shelton was talking about the other, the other day, and so I can get here in time. And uh, so I do want to say I appreciate my, my wife uh, bring, bringing uh, church clothes to me so I didn't have to run all the way home and do all that, just, or else you're going to have a guy with an RTI shirt on um, coming straight out of IT meetings, so uh, nobody wants that. So um, anyway, um, so we're going to get into the Word, and, and we're going to be focusing on um, a passage of Scripture. It actually takes place twice, um, both in First Kings and also in Second Chronicles. Of course, Kings and Chronicles are books that mirror each other and, and uh, talk a lot about the, uh, tell a couple different perspectives of, of some of the same stories uh, about the different kings of, of Israel and the kings of Judah. Um, and uh, we're going to focus on, on the dedication of Solomon's temple tonight, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about, about dedication. Um, it takes dedication to, to make it. The Bible says, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Uh, you're not going to make it uh, living for God without dedication. Um, I, I will tell you that, that you're not going to be successful at anything in life without dedication. You want to have a successful career, it takes dedication. You want to have a Successful marriage, it, it takes dedication. Uh, but above all else, if you want to have a successful life of living for the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it takes dedication. And so we're going to talk about the dedication of Solomon's temple. Um, it fascinates me because of how God responds uh, in this moment. Um, just to kind of start really at, at the end of, of it, um, in First Kings Chapter, chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And this is, again, this is, this is kind of towards, towards the end of, of all of this, of Solomon building the temple. I want to start here to kind of show you um, why, why this fascinates me and why I wanted to ask the Lord some questions about it. And um, so we're jumping into the temple has been built and the Ark of the Covenant is being returned to the temple and Solomon is getting ready to have his prayer of dedication and offer sacrifices and the Lord begins to react in a powerful way in verse 10 it says it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy places after they took the Ark of the Covenant back into the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. As a powerful demonstration of the Spirit of God, not something that you see very often in, in the Bible. This much of a manifestation, the Shekinah glory of God being manifest in a way where the priest could not even stand to minister because of the cloud, because of the holiness of God that was there, because of the glory of God that was there. When the book of Second Chronicles chapter 5 records this, um, 
it says in 5 and 14, just to show you where you would find this in Second Chronicles, it says that the priest could not stand and minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So it fascinates me because I want to do something that invokes this kind of reaction from God. I, I, I begin to ask, like, hey, God, what was it about this moment? What, what did Solomon and them do that caused you to react in such a powerful way? Now, obviously, right, this is, the, this is not a small thing. It is the dedication of the temple. We're going to get some, some end of that. But I believe there are some things that Solomon does particularly as the leader of the people there that caused God, that he had to react in the way to, to show not just the people of God, but also the foreigners in the land and everybody in the surrounding area, that God was blessing what Solomon was doing. So I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, I love being in the presence of God, but I want to be in the presence of God in such a way that, that you can't even hardly stand to be in, the, in that presence, kind of presence. It's not a presence I've been in very often. I, I, I will confess to you tonight. That the kind of presence that I, that I read about in, in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles is not something that I've experienced very many times in my life. There have been moments where I've, and I'm sure you've experienced them as well. Many of us have experienced them here in this building where the power of God is so thick that you just want to just lay down on the ground and get as low as possible because the strength of God is in the place. And you have, I don't know, sometimes even how else to react to the holiness of God. That is what they were experiencing on this day, the Shekinah glory, the cloud, that same cloud that had guided them through the wilderness, that same cloud that was over their head as, as they marched across the Red Sea, that, that, that cloud that was, that was there you know, around the mountain while Moses was, was, was getting the ticket man, but that cloud was there in their presence on that day. And that's the kind of experience that I want to have with God. So how did, how did we get here? How did we get to this place of this? And so going back to, to 1 Kings chapter 5, um, again, just to set the stage, and again, I'm, I'm just going to do teaching tonight. There's, there's, no, there's no real great revelation in, in any of this, but there, I believe there are some practicalness to help us to all get to a place where, where God can, can move in the way he wants to move. Because this type of, this type of experience that they had, the, the, the Shekinah glory coming that, down in their presence in that way. This wasn't like a one-time thing that God said, hey, I'm going to do this one time. I never want to ex- do this again. God desires for us to be in his presence. He desires not just for us just to, to, to come into the building and to worship, but to, but to truly be in the presence of the almighty God. Sometimes I, you just have to stop and think about the fact of that, who it is that we're worshiping. This is, the, this is the first and the last I'm talking about, the Alpha, the Omega. There are many times when, and when I get here and preach over his prayer, and all I, all I ever want to start doing at the beginning of about every time I sit, sit, whether it's here praying, praying in my house, in my car, wherever, you know, I just have to sometimes, I have to always want to start and just tell God, hey, I know who it is I'm talking to here. That I, I, I'm also reminding myself that when I'm coming here in prayer, I'm not praying to, to, to some imaginary figure. I'm not, I'm not praying to, to some, to some made-up fairies. I'm not, this isn't about, again, appeasing my own flesh or things like that. I am talking to the very being that created heaven and earth, to the one who somehow thought of all of this. And, and there's so many things. I mean, I, I can't even begin to fathom his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Isaiah said that our righteousness, his righteousness is as, my righteousness is as filthy rags compared to his. I mean, this is who we are praying to and who we want to have an experience with. And so, um, so God desires to, to, to grant us this, this audience. He wants us to get to, be, to this place, but he doesn't just let anybody into the holies of holies. It's for everybody. The, holies, the, the presence of God is for everybody. But, but there, is, there are some things that I believe that we do to help us to get to where God can move in the way he wants us to move, to move in our midst. So in 1 Kings, here we are. We, we are at the transition of King David. And David has transitioned his kingship 
over to his son, Solomon. And Solomon, almost immediately, of course, I, I'm, I'm going to skip over the first few chapters of Kings here, when Solomon takes his kingship and he has a dream and he asks God for wisdom, we know all that. But it, it's not, not long after that, and, and then in 1 Kings uh, chapter 5, that there's this King Hiram, King Hiram of, of Tyre. He's in his service unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. So this is a, a ne- nearby neighboring king who had, um, had had a peace tree with David, and, and David and him had some sort of peace between their kingship and our kingship. It, it, there's even some scholars who believe that, that, that this King Hiram had at some point in time converted to to uh, Judaism, had, had converted over to being a follower, a follower of Jehovah. But for whatever reason, there was this, this, this friendship between David and this other King Hiram of Tyre. And he, he finds out that Solomon has become king in verse 2. says, And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how David my father could not build the house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side. And to the Lord put under the soles, put them under the soles of his feet. So David is, or Solomon is acknowledging to this king that his father could not build the tabernacle. And we know this because that David was a man of war. And because David had shed much blood, God had told David that it, the, the tabernacle that, that you desire to build for me, you're not going to build it, but your son Solomon is going to build this tabernacle for me. Because it's hard, to, to, it's hard to take the time of, of what it's going to take to build this when you're in a battle all the time. And so David could not, God could not give David this task, but it was for Solomon to have it. Verse 4 says, but now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so there is neither adversary nor evil occurring. So the first thing I notice here is that Solomon is telling him that because of what the battles his father had fought for him, because of the, the things that David had done, that Solomon recognized that he's about to enter a time of peace so that he has the ability to put his focus not on battling a war against enemies, but about for building a house for God. And that word adversary there literally is the same word for Satan. So it says that neither is, there is neither Satan nor evil occurring. When God finally was moving on Solomon, it's time for Solomon to begin to build the house, the tabernacle, that God had subdued all of Solomon's enemies. So I, I would say to us tonight that when God is desiring to build something great in your life, that he will make it in so that no enemy could come against you. Sometimes I think that we're worried about building a house for God. We're worried about building something that where God can dwell. We're worried about doing things of God because we're worried about attack of the enemy. Sometimes that, that there are those moments where we, where we feel an unction from God to do something that God has called us to do. And what makes us nervous sometimes is that we're nervous about, am I going to be able to accomplish this? Am I, am I going to be up for the task that God wants me to do? And it's a big task. Solomon was not taking on a small thing. You and I are not taking on a small thing. We're launching a new campus in Jeffersonville. We're looking at other property. We're, 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 we're not taking on small things. And so there are times when you have to wonder and ask yourself, okay, are we going to be able to complete this task? What I love about this verse is that it tells me that when it is time for unlimited expansion, that there is not going to be a devil nor an adversary nor an evil occurring. So Solomon is saying, I might have to worry about a lot of things, but I'll tell you one thing I'm not going to worry about, and that's the devil. So and my first thing I want to tell you to us tonight is that there are a lot of things you might have to worry about, but one thing that we should never worry about, one thing that we should never fret, is I am not one bit concerned about the devil. That he is not really that much of an adversary for me when I am doing the will of God. The only time I should ever worry about the devil is when I'm outside of the presence of God. The only time I should ever be concerned about whether or not I can complete the thing that I'm setting myself to do is if I'm outside of the will of God. If I'm inside the will of God, then there is no adversary. 
There is no devil. There is nothing that will stop me. There is no evil occurrence that can come up against me. So Solomon recognized it's time to build the tabernacle for God because my father David had subdued all of the enemies under his feet. And now there is nothing but a little bit of hard work and labor that's going to be staying in my way from building this tabernacle. Verse 5 says, And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto my name. Solomon recognized his purpose. He said, I purpose to build a house. He said, this is my purpose. We have to find our purpose. It's hard to be dedicated to something if you don't feel like that's really your purpose in life. When you don't really feel like you have a purpose in life, it'll just be a fad. You know, I'm going to better my life this way. I'm I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to school. I want to know why I graduated from college. Because I felt like it was my purpose to become a school teacher. And when I had set in my heart that I was going to become an educator, that I was going to get my license to teach mathematics, I know, don't be jealous. I know all of you love math. <laughs> and you're like, man, that was your purpose. That was my purpose. I felt it. It was within everything in me. All I ever wanted to do from the time I was in third grade was be a school teacher. Yes, I was that kid. <laughs> That's all I ever wanted to do. And because I felt the purpose in that desire, then I knew that I was going to accomplish that goal. I knew that there was nothing that was going to stop me from going to college, completing college, getting my license. And even when I first started doing my student teaching, and I thought to myself, man, what have I got myself into? There was still nothing that was going to stop me. I got married, right, you know, as I told you guys 23 years ago. I was 19 years old when I got married. When I remember I tell him, telling my dad, that, that Ruth and I want, were wanting to get married. Yeah, he kind of had the same chuckle reaction. <laughs> oh, really? He, he, he said, hey, I, I have one condition. You got to finish school. And I said, Dad, I, I have no other, other desire to ever, to ever stop with school. And so I said, I promise you, you know, I want to be a school teacher because I was a little kid. I'm, I'm going to finish college. And so that purpose was what drove me. It like, helped me keep my dedication to the things of God. Help me keep my dedication to, to the task at hand. So Solomon is writing this letter. He says, I have purpose to build this house. In other words, I'm just letting everybody know. I'm putting it pen to paper of what I'm going to accomplish. And Solomon is setting the tone for the next few years of his life that I am making myself a dedicated person to building the house of God. Because if you don't have a purpose in life, then you're rudderless. You don't have a purpose in the things that you do, then everything becomes a small habit. You might stick to it for a little while, but ultimately it falls by the, by the wayside. And the purpose that he grabbed onto was the promise, not one that he had heard himself, but it was one that God had given David. He grasped on to the vision of his father. You know, much like many of the things that, that we do and that we are following for God, it, it's not necessarily the things that you and I have even chosen to do, but it's the things that, that the Lord has spoken to us from, from behind this pulpit. He, ha, he said, I am going to, going to grip on to the promises of my father David. The things that God had promised David, I want to make sure that what God had told my father he would accomplish and what would be accomplished in the land, I have a purpose to see those promises come to pass. Amen. And I feel the same way. The things that, 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 that Bishop has preached behind this pulpit. And I, 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 I feel determined to make sure that those things come to pass. Just the same way that Solomon gripped onto the promises of David. I hope that all of us are catching onto the vision of this church. So that we can say, I have a purpose to every promise that God has given our bishop. I'm going to work as hard as I can to bring those promises to pass. That God, if you will grant me peace in my land, help me to overcome my adversaries, that I have purpose in my heart today to do the things that God you have given 
our bishop and the vision you've given him. Amen. This was not something that necessarily that God had talked to Solomon about at first, but it was first promised to his father. And I pray this for my kids. I know our youth are not in, in here tonight, but I, I pray for our young people that the things that God has promised my wife and I, even if they're things that, that if the Lord tears, we don't see everything come to pass the way that, that we feel like we would see in our lifetime. I, I, I pray that, that my boys pick up that mantle and run with it. You know, I know many of you are second, third generation, fourth and fifth generation apostolics. I know that many of you in this room are looking at not just the promise of thing that God has given you, but the promises that God has given your parents. And you're saying, God, I'm going to stick with this until I see every promise come to pass. So as we as parents here in this room tonight, I, I'm so glad that, that Solomon knew what God had promised his dad. I'm so glad that, that David had taught Solomon and had told him, this is what God told me was going to happen. This is the promise that God gave me. I, Solomon, I want to build this tabernacle so bad that it's not for me, but I'm passing this promise on to you. The power of a parent to be able to pass on the promises of God onto our children. I, I, I don't take that lightly. I mean, there are things I want to make sure I pass on to that next generation. There are things that I want my boys to grip onto so that they one day can move with purpose in this life. So we as parents, we have the responsibility to pass on the promises that God has given us. And there are many things that maybe that God gives us promises just for that purpose so that we can hold to them and, and, and hold on to them and then pass them on to that next generation when it is time. Not for us to go off into retirement, but because it is just meant for them to really be the fulfillment of those promises. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with my kids having a better life than me. I'm okay with my kids having a better revival than me. I'm okay with my kids being more blessed than I am. I'm not, I'm not just okay with it. It's what I want and what I desire. So David could have been bitter. David could have been bitter about the fact he didn't get to build the tabernacle of God, but instead he taught his son Solomon, this is what God has for you to do. And so Solomon, as soon as he gets the chance, this is just, uh, if you were to read through all this, and again, I don't have the time to do it, if you were to go back and look through these chapters of the first, you know, five through eight of First Kings and where Second Chronicles, um, you know, uh, around that same time, around five, five through eight or so, um, you will see this just a this is just a few months into Solomon's reign, and, and Solomon's right away saying, "Hey, it's time for me to build this tabernacle." So he's writing this letter, and I, I, I hasten on here. Verse six says, "Now therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees." Out of Lebanon. And my servant shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. So he's, he, he is asking this king to get him the cedar trees of Lebanon. These are the massive trees that if, if you were to Read later in the same chapter when the king agrees to this, he has them to cut down these trees. And these are these skilled men. And these are, they, uh, Solomon recognizes that, that the skill sets of these people are, are not, not the skill set that they have there in, in the land of Israel. These are not, these, these, this, uh, uh, these people who have these, uh, the ability to hew down these trees and, and to, uh, what they do, they, they, they cut them down and they build rafts out of them. And then they, they float them over to, uh, across the sea, and, and when they get there, they pull them on the land, and they take them apart, and that's how they transport them over to Jerusalem. But he recognized that that he was going to, to that God, in order to build this tabernacle, he will utilize even those outside of the kingdom to help make sure the tabernacle gets built with the right material. And and Solomon was not afraid to to, to reach out for help to find the right skill set. It, it takes skill set to build the tabernacle for God. In order to have this type of thing be put together, it takes a certain amount of skill that Solomon recognized that they didn't have. So he calls for these cedar trees. Now, these cedar trees are interesting because, it, because of, of, of the fact that, that no man planted these cedar trees. These are, these are what, what I, I was reading in the commentary, they're talking about the fact that, that in these trees, in this forest where these cedar trees are cut down in, in, in Lebanon, that... They regarded them as God's forest. This was, this was God's forest, is what one historian said it was, it was already referred to as. Because this was a, a forest that God had planted. 
and had planted for this purpose. I, these, these were massive trees that they cut down. And David had wrote, and I believe it was David that wrote the psalm, Psalm 104, verse 16. It says, the trees of the Lord are well cared for, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. These were the trees that God planted, that God had way back hundreds of years prior had planted this forest in Lebanon, knowing that one day Solomon would need it in order to help build the tabernacle for the Most High. See, God has the provision already out there for you to complete the task that God wants you to do. So when I talk about dedication tonight, I'm telling you that it, it is okay to dedicate your life to this because God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Solomon went to, he, he said, I need the best trees. and I need the most skilled treesmen. Brother, Brother Steve, you would have been up for the task for this job. He said, Solomon, call me up. I'm ready to cut down some cedar trees of Lebanon. Because God had already provided. He, he planted that forest. It is, the, it is the forest, it is the cedar trees that he planted. God had given them provision. It's, you, can, you have safety in dedicating your life to God. Because God will give you provision. It's already there. The things that you need to be successful are already planted in your life. You might not even recognize it. You might not even understand why your life has taken the turns that it has or the, that God has put certain people in your life. God has given you certain skill sets. God has given you a certain direction and certain, certain personality. But I'm telling you that the, the, you are the person that you are today because God knows that's the person you need to be to live for him. Because God will give you provision. He had this forest planted long before Solomon ever decided to build that temple. Those trees were growing. Let's give it over to Second Chronicles just to look at some of the ways that when Solomon begins to build this temple from their perspective. Because it, it reads slightly different. There's no real discrepancies, but one shares it a different way than, than the other. So um, you all have to bear with me because I, I listen to both of these sections on repeat for my five and a half hour drive home from ch Chicago. And I studied it late in my hotel room last night. Speaking of which, I, I, I got to tell the story. This morning I was leaving the hot hotel room. And leaving, leaving my hotel, get, and go in my car, and go, go grab some breakfast, go to my first meeting. And at that Holiday Inn, which this isn't a plug for Holiday Inn, but that's just where I, where I stay and earn my points. And I walked out in that portico, and there's, there's music playing. And I walk out, and all I hear is, ow, I feel good. <laughs> I was like, I cannot escape this song. <laughs> and so, anyway. Had, had to share. Um, so in Second Chronicles chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in uh, Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Aruna, the, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The construction began in the midspring during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. Four years. So we're just a few months into Solomon's reign. He begins to write the letter. He begins to gather material. For four years, he's gathering. David had already done a lot of, a lot of the work on, on the instruments for the tabernacle, but the material that, that they needed. Solomon dedicated four years before they ever started actual construction on the tabernacle of God. That's, that's dedication. Dedication takes preparation. 
You know, we, we rush through these stories sometimes, and, and we don't think about the timeline of it. I'm, I'm always cautioning myself when I'm reading about what God does for people in the, in the Scripture to think about the context of it and the time that Solomon put into this work. Because if you're going to do something great for God, it takes a large amount of preparation. You know, we're hastening towards you know, where we started tonight in, in, in 1 Kings 7 or 8. But before we get there, there, there's four years of just gathering materials for this thing. Gathering the cedar trees. The, 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 we'll read about the gold and things like that. I don't have time to go into I I would encourage you to read through these chapters in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Because it, it, to me, it's just fascinating. All the things that Solomon put in the work, the craftsmanship. To do something great for God, it, it takes preparation. It takes time. You can't rush into this stuff. Now, God can do a quick work. Right? I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not negating what the, 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 the quickness of, of God and God's ability to do something supernatural in a moment. But, but, but when God moved in, in, in our scripture text tonight, when God moved uh, back in, in, in 1 Kings chapter, chapter 8, there was a lot of preparation that went into that moment. Just to, just to kind of push us forward a little bit, the, the, way, the reason why God moved at the dedication of Solomon's temple the way that he did is because that was a culmination. It wasn't about the, the event itself, but it was about the culmination of what Solomon had done for years preparing for that moment. And so sometimes we want to have a great move of God, but we want to have a microwave move of God. When God said, hey, no, I've got to build up to this. Because if God was to really pour out his presence on us, and we hadn't really prepared ourselves for that presence, I'm telling you right now, my heart would just flat out stop. We're not equipped in our humanity to handle in our flesh the things that God wants to do for us. We're not equipped... That's why, why God had to tell Moses, hey, I, I can't show you my glory. I, I, I can only show you my hinder parts. You, I've got to put you down in the, in, in the cleft of this rock because the presence of God, it takes preparation to get ready for that. Now, now listen, I, again, I'm not negating the fact that we all can come boldly into the throne room of God. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying tonight. But there are things that God is trying to, to get a truly great, dynamic, Shekinah glory moment of God. It takes some dedication uh, to living for God in a different kind of way. I felt the presence of God the very first time I, I ever came to church. I heard the first, the very, when I first started coming as a 17-year-old, I could feel the presence of God right away. But I'm not talking about just feeling his presence. I'm talking about, about being in, that, in, the, in those, those dedication moments, those moments that are just beyond just being in those little goosebumps on, on your arms. In those memorable moments when you, when you, when you leave a, a, a service or you leave a moment and you say, okay, I'm never going to forget this service. This is a this is a, a recorded a special much like what, what we had around here just the other Thursday night with Bishop Bourne. That was a special moment. It didn't happen on, on a whim, but we, we we've been Bishop's been building us, us up to that moment. He's been preparing us. God's been preparing us for moments like that. So when the Word of God comes forth, we have the faith to receive it and to act upon it. And so he spent four years gathering materials, gathering that cedar and gathering all the things that they need uh, to do all these things, to build this, this temple. Jumping back to 1 Kings chapter, chapter 6, because there's not just cedar wood that's building this tabernacle. He has, there's a lot of stone, and I, I, just, I don't have time to go into all the, all the work of all of this. But he has these large stones that, that, he, that he created, that he they crafted to build this. And, and um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's one row of cedar wood, three blocks of stone, another row of cedar wood, or it could be the other, other way around, um, to, to make the foundation strong for this building, for this tabernacle, this beautiful sanctuary for God that he's building. 
But I, I found this phraseology interesting in 1 Kings chapter 6 when it's describing how the stones were made. And New Living Translation says like this, the stones were used in the construction of the temple were finished in the quarry, so there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any iron tool at the, the building site. When he is building this, everything that was, all the stones that were made for this temple, they were finished at the quarry. So there would be no hammer, no axe, no debris. It was a real clean construction site. I've been on some construction sites. I've, I don't think I ever would use the word clean to describe a construction site. But this was how Solomon wanted to build this tabernacle for God. The stones that they crafted, these large blocks. I can imagine him having his meetings and telling them, okay, we need this many blocks. And, and if you read, I mean, there are literally thousands of people working on this tabernacle. Hundred thousands of these and 30,000 of people doing this. I think, I think there was like 3,000 or so foremen. 3,000 bosses on the job. I don't know if they were doing anything, just wearing hard hats, barking out orders like foremen do, do today. And so a couple of laughters, you must have had some formers in your life. Didn't do any work, just bossed you around. <laughs> but regardless, the stones were, were made in the quarry. They were formed there in the quarry. And then they were brought to the tabernacle and put into the right position and place. And I, I began to just to think on that and pray about that and, and, to, and to, to realize that that there are, there, there are some things that, there's, there's a shaping that needs to take place in the quarry before coming and fitting yourself into the tabernacle. And it happened outside of the house of God, outside of the tabernacle is where this shaping took place. And I just began to think about the fact that, you know, I need God to, to work, work on me in my, in my home. So that when I, when I come as part of the tabernacle, because, you know, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that we are lively stones fitly joined together, that, when, that, that these stones are a type of shadow of you and I, of the, of the church. Now, I'm not talking about, about getting good to get God. That's not what I'm talking about. Bishop loves when it happens to me. <laughs> so, if you're watching Bishop, there you go. It happened to me. And so... If he's watching, he's probably has a fist bump right now. Like, yeah, microphone got Brother Clark. But he had to, these, these, these stones were, were, they were formed outside. They were hammered outside of the house of God. They were, they were shaved down. They were shaping into, into the right shape. Because the, in the house of God, he didn't, he didn't want, this, 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 this was a holy place to Solomon. He said, there, there are some things that you can't bring into the house. There's some debris that you can't bring into the house of God. There, there, there's, there's some dirt, there's some junk in your life that you cannot let make its way into the house of God. So part of being dedicated is saying, God, shape me while I'm in my quarry. Shape me while I'm out here. Shape me in my prayer closet. You got to have a prayer closet. Dedication is about, is about having a prayer closet so that God can make you into the, the right size stone that you need to be so that when he goes to put you into the wall, you fit in the place where God wants you to fit. It can't, oh, everything can't happen here at the church. We've heard our bishop say many, many times that there's not enough services in the year. There's not enough messages preached behind this pulpit to, to, to help all of us with every aspect of our life. That's why we have to have a prayer life. That's why we have to have a study life. That's why I'm, I'm so glad that I have boys that, that get up and read the Bible every morning when they get out of bed. I'm so glad that, that my, my wife and I talk about the Scripture with our kids. My wife is fantastic about making sure that our boys are studying their Bible and, and, and asking them questions about what they're reading and what they talked about in class, what was discussed at, at youth, and all that kind of stuff. It's important because we're shaping them in the while they're in the quarry. When you pray at home, God is shaving things off at you so that when you come and God needs to put you into your right place in the temple of God, there's not any kind of debris that you're bringing in from the outside into God's holy house. So Solomon recognized that 
Now, I, I, I can't have all that sound of hammering and axe and other iron tools on the building site where there's some things that have to happen on the outside. God isn't going to shape everything about your life just while you're here at the church. You spend such a small amount of time here at Greater Faith. Even if you come here and pray every day, even if you're here at every service, such a small percentage of your life and my life takes place in a church service. And that's why we have to let God shape us while we're still in the quarry. I let God to shave some things off of us. God to move some things in our, in our life. So those stones that, 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 that Solomon put in there, they've been shaped, they've been measured twice and cut once. That's what builders tell me they do at least. I want to know. But it happened out there. And if we're dedicated to this, if we're dedicated to this to be successful, because there's nothing worse than putting something together and when you're done building it, stepping back and going, nope, that's not right. Which is back when I was foolish enough to try to put things like bookshelves together and things like that. It wasn't level. Extra parts. None of that. It just wasn't happening. I don't think I've told you before that, you know, my wife is way better at building things than I am. I'm like a bull in the china shop and it's much more destructive than I am constructive. And so, you know, I just, you know, buy something. All right, I'm going to take the kids. We're going to go get something to eat and let me know when you're done, Ruth. <laughs> Y'all laugh, but there's a massive amount of truth to that statement. And so, because when I would do it, it wouldn't be straight. I had to tear the thing apart, start over again, and, you know, pray through and, and all that. <laughs> and so, but Solomon said, hey, I, we, we have to have these, this done correctly. This is the temple of God. These stones have got to be shaped in this way, moved this way. And we're going we're gonna to do it out while they're, while they're there so that when they come, they just fit perfectly in the position. God, when you're dedicated to, to fulfilling the purpose of God in your life, God will shape you in a way that when, you, when it's your time to, to get into position, You'll just, you'll just slide right in. You know, we're not, this, this isn't a square peg in a round hole situation. This is a, a God will shape you in, into the person that you need to be so that you can fit in your place in the temple of God. And when, when those cedar trees got into the right place, and when those stones got into the right place, and when, when all of the instruments, and man, if I had the time tonight and we had weeks to dive into this. We can talk about the, um, the golden basin of water that, that he made. And everything that Solomon did with the temple was so much bigger than just the tabernacle. It was the, the, the temple that Solomon built was twice the size of the tabernacle of Moses. Everything that Solomon did was bigger. He made it bigger. He made the tabernacle bigger. He made, he made the outer court bigger. He made holies of holies area bigger. He, they had the, the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant, but Solomon constructed two other cherubims that, that filled. They, they were 30 feet across, their wings touching from tip to tip, 30 feet. Massive, because Solomon said this is the temple of God. And he made this gi ginormous facility. And when it was all said and done, God filled every ounce of it. Even Solomon said, and, and talking about this, I'll paraphrase it. At one point, Solomon was talking about this. He said, he said we're building a tabernacle, but, 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 but really, how can we build a tabernacle for the God who fills the universe? How can we build a tabernacle for God who's all this big? We're, we're going to do the best that we can. We're going to build the, the best facility that you've ever seen, the biggest, the largest, the most beautiful, most expensive tabernacle to, to worship God in. But, but even Solomon understood that what he was doing was only going to fit a fraction of God into that place. But God filled every ounce of that building, even though it was twice the size of, of the tabernacle, that the, the temple that, 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 that Solomon built was twice the size of the tabernacle of Moses. God filled, had no problem filling every ounce of it. 
And I say it because I say that, that when, we, when, when you make more room for God, God will give you more of him. To me, that's the lesson of this. That's the lesson about this, why I want to be dedicated to build something bigger and better for God in my life. I want to make a bigger room for God to minister in my life. God moved in that special way because Solomon took special care to follow through on, on the things that God had promised David, his father. So he had the right tools. He had the right people. He followed this, this right process. And time is running out of me here. I'm, I'm going to share a couple more things, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up tonight. because I think I started going about five minutes or so before eight, if I remember correctly. I always look at my clock, and then I never pay attention to the numbers that I read. <laughs> it's a true story. I tell myself every time, Brother Justin. All right, pay attention, pay attention. What time do you start? What time do you start? And then 20 minutes later, I'm like, what time did I start? <laughs> it's terrible. Second Chronicles chapter 3, uh, verse 17. The Bible says that then he set up two pillars at the entrance of the temple. One, the south entrance, and the other to the, to the north. The name of one in the, in the south was Jacob, and the one in the north was Boaz. So, Psalm building, and, the, and, and these, these two pillars that he builds are, I think they're 30 feet tall, and they're eight feet in diameter, I mean, eight feet circumference, maybe, one, one of the two. And these massive towers, massive pillars on, 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 on the entrance of this tabernacle. I just, anytime there's a name assigned to something, so Josh, I'm always just fascinated. Okay, what does that mean? You know, why did, why did Solomon choose these two names? And, and um, Jacob means that, that he, he will establish. It means, to, means to, to be stable. And Boaz means to, in strength. And this is a, not, this is a different Boaz and Ruth and Boaz, and, and that and that story. That's that's not where historians believe that 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 name came from of why Solomon chose that name, but but Solomon recognized that that everything he was building, it was because God had established this stuff that He will establish that God will establish, and that it was the strength of God that gave him the ability to fulfill this prophetic word in his life. He said, I never want to forget where my strength came from. I never want to forget that, that, that where, where, my, where, where, where my foundation is. That all, I need these two pillars in my life to know that, I, that if I'm, if I'm going to be stable, it's not because, because of me. That my stability is not on my own two feet, but it's, it's the foundation that's beneath my feet. So Solomon building this temple, he said, I, I got to have two large reminders that, that, that my stability comes from God, and that my strength comes from God, that if I'm going to be dedicated to the things of God, if I'm going to complete the task that God wants me to do, then I got to have his strength, and I got to have, have his foundation so that I have something to build upon, and so he built these two pillars, every time they walked in, it was a reminder to them that their strength came from God, that their stability came from God, that God had established these things in their life. And there's so much more I would love to get into, into tonight. So many other things that helped in all of this. I'm going to come give some folks hope over here. The whole room is covered in silver, gold, all these instruments that David had, had prepared and dedicated, just the expense of it all. The amount that Solomon, I, I, I just wonder like how much of the wealth of the kingdom had been poured into this building of the tabernacle. Just, just the sheer amount of it. All in all, he's, he spent seven years, seven years building the tabernacle. Four of it in preparation, 
three of it in construction. More time spent preparing than building. That is how important preparation is. Before God can ever trust you to complete the task that he has given you, he has to know that you are preparing yourself for the completion of that task. So for seven years, he builds the tabernacle. Now, I find it fascinating that he also spends 13 years building his own house. There's a lot of things you can read into that. Solomon, who we know has quite an issue with pride later in his life, especially. Or you can look at the fact that, I don't know about you, but I, I definitely feel like I, I have a lot more work to do on my own house. <laughs> working on me is a, a lot of a, more of a task than working, working on God. God's, you know, perfect out the gate. But I, 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 I'm a continual work. And if you read the, the construction of Solomon's house, he also uses those same cedar trees. He uses some of those same stones. And he follows the same pattern. So the, the row of, of trees, three rows of stone, rows of trees, all that. He follows the same pattern for building his own house as he used to build the tabernacle for God. And there's a lesson in that for us is that the things that, that we build here, that I, I, I pray that the things that you amen here at the, at the church are, are, represent, are represented in, in your own house. I pray that, that, that the tabernacle that you're building here at church, right, the reputation that you're building here at church, that you have the same reputation in your home, the same reputation on your job. I, I, I don't want them to build, I don't want my house of God to look one way, then my own home to look so, like something completely different. So when Solomon built his own home, he said, I need to tabernacle my house. I need my house to look just like the house that we're building for God. And that is ultimately where we all need to be. I want to work on two things simultaneously, building a work for God and building that same type of house in my own personal walk. Because what profit it if I, if I do all of this, but the way I live out, outside of these four walls doesn't match what I'm building inside this tabernacle. Then, that, then that's where I, I can gain the whole world but lose my soul. I, I'm nothing more than a hypocrite at that point. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I mean, you say a lot of things about Solomon. I, I, well, I, I, I actually, I love the fact that he took the, the pattern. He said, man, that's a good-looking house we just built for God. I think I'm going to build the same thing. Kind of remind me, I think Brother Jones, think Brother Tim Jones and I talked, remember one time he was showing me a house that he was making, and he was like, sometimes I design houses. I think I remember this conversation correctly. But he was like, I'm like, man, I think I was build my, my house this way. <laughs> Imagine if you're a builder sometimes, you're thinking, Brother Dwayne, you probably built some, some decks and been like, that looks better than the deck I have in my own house. I think I'm going to go build that deck in my own house now. And that's what Solomon was saying. He said, man, we made this tabernacle for God. I want, I want my home to match the house of God. So as you stand to your feet tonight, all these things that Solomon did, he purposed to build the house of, of God. He took the provision that God had given him and he put, put it to work. He worked on the stones outside in the, in the quarry so that when, they, when it was time for them to be put in place, he spent all that time preparing so that when it was time to build, he was ready to build and he could succeed in his building. And then he went, he, 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 he fetches the Ark of the Covenant. I'm, I'm going to close with this. This is so important. If you can go to Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 9. I'm going to close on these three verses, 9, 10, and um, 11. Yeah, King James Version is fine. 
So he, he calls for, the, for them to bring the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon doesn't make the same mistake as his dad David did. The priest carried the proper way. They bring it in to the holies of holies. And when they put the Ark of the Covenant in the place, the Bible says in verse 9, they drew out the stays of the Ark. These were the two poles that were on either side of the Ark that were used to, to carry it while it was in part of the tabernacle. But when it, gets to, when it gets to the temple, he says, now that the Ark of the Covenant is where it is meant to be. And he, and then the ends of the stage were seen from the Ark before the Oracle. They were not seen without this. There it is unto this day. In other words, he took the, the staves out, and that is where the Ark of the Covenant was meant to stay for the rest of, of its days. The Ark of the Covenant is representation of the presence of God. And when you get... When you get your purpose right, when you, and you get to that, that construction right in your life, and, you, and you're crafting your, your home in the right way, and you're crafting your ministry and your walk with God the right way, and the presence of God comes into, into the life in, in that moment, it, it's time to remove the stays and say, this, this, this is where the presence of God is meant to be in my life, and I'm not going to keep moving it around. And that was the whole purpose of the stays, was to move from place to place. But now God had found a resting place in the temple of Solomon that Solomon had built for him. And at that moment, it was no longer time. There comes a time in your life when you, you got to stop moving God around in your life. They would moved God around and they'd gone through the wilderness and all that. But this was a moment where it's like, no, God had found a permanent place. And when God found that permanent place, God had found it. It, that's when the stays were removed down. Verse 10 tells us there was nothing in the ark to save the two tables with Moses had put the in at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. I don't have time to go into why just the, the tables are there and no longer the uh, Aaron's rod or the pot of manna. But verse 11 says, It came to pass when the priests had come out of the holy place. For all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. And I'm, I'm, ending, I'm ending with this verse here. Because that phrase it means they did not wait by course. It means that they, one verse, one verse says that all the priests showed up even if they weren't on duty that day. Everybody was chipping in. Even the priests who weren't supposed to be on duty that day, they all came to see the Ark of the Covenant find its resting place. And it, it's in that setting, it's in that moment where it, it didn't matter if whose job was who, there was no more big eyes and little U's, and none of that junk was going on in this moment. They all were working towards this common goal. They all were dedicated to see the temple of God built. They were all about wanting to get the presence of God. Everybody, I mean, thousands of people were chipping into this moment. And it was in, in that type of unity, that type of preparation, that type of craftsmanship, everybody on board. It's in that type of setting that the power of God was able to fall in. So back to my original question of all this, is why I said, God, you know, what, what, caused, what caused you to move in, in, a, in a way that that people couldn't even, even stand to minister anymore because your presence was so strong. You know, I hear the, the, the voice of God you know, saying it's, it's, it's because they were, they were dedicated the entire time. The, the, the dedication of Solomon's temple wasn't just a moment. It was a process. And because everybody was chipping in, because everybody was not worried about what their job was or anything like that, they were all just working towards a common goal. Everybody was, 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 was pushing to get this temple built. Everybody was, was all in on it. God said, I can always move when unity is across the entire congregation. And so when, we're, when we have our own personal dedication to God, when we dedicate our lives in a special way, it unlocks something so special. It unlocks God's ability to move in our life in, in a way that's, that is just unique when we truly dedicate ourselves to the things of God. So I just want us just to, just to pray, and we're going to pray a prayer of dedication. 
And I would just ask that we just take some time tonight just asking God to help us to be more dedicated to God's kingdom, to God's purpose. And I want you to just pray where you stand right now. Let's just ask God just to help us to be dedicated people. God, I thank you, Lord God, tonight.